tonight is a very special night because this is our closing event uh, for uh, a series of events dedicated to uh, Aimé Césaire. Uh, this year, uh, uh, 2013, was a centennial year for one of the greatest um, French-speaking writers of the 21st century uh, who hails from Martinique. Uh, I happen to also be from Martinique, so I'm very standing here very proud that we were able to celebrate him for the whole year. Um, so the Schomburg Center was very, very happy to be able to partner with a series of institutions uh, to be able to uh, celebrate him throughout the city all through the year. So the Martinique Tourism Authority um, joined, um, we joined with them and uh, organized a series of events. One was at uh, Medgar Evers, with the Center for Black Literature, and we presented a film screening of A Voice for History, uh, directed by the renowned Zan Palsi, the film director. Um, and we also had the pleasure to partner with uh, Columbia University for um, uh, a stage um, uh, presentation of Notebook of a Return to My Native Land. Uh, this was done in English, and this was the first time that I heard uh, the text uh, said in English on stage. It was very, very powerful uh, presentation by Jacques Martial. Uh, we also uh, partnered with the America so so Society of the Americas for a bilingual reading of Notebook of a Return to the Native Land. And tonight, uh, we have uh, the pleasure to re to welcome Rico Speck with his um, A Season in the Congo um, for an excerpt tonight followed by a conversation with Alex Gilles from Columbia University. So I would like to um, uh, now take a moment to bring the voice of Aimé Césaire as part of this evening and we are going to watch a quick excerpt from uh, A Voice for History, so please uh, enjoy. au-dessus des cyclones. Et l'Afrique entendra, l'Afrique répondra. Du haut du mont Pelé, érupte, rutilant, le grand cri nègre. Et lui répondra, l'espérance. Enfin, Mandela est... Enfin, Mandela est sorti de prison. Enfin, Mandela est libre. C'était vraiment un, un cri de joie euh, extraordinaire et pour toute l'humanité. En tout cas, pour moi, je me rappelle que ce jour-là, je me promenais sur une des routes de la Martinique qui était un jour fantastique, qui était apparition de, une apparition extraordinaire. Je crois que vous étiez avec moi hein, l'éclosion des Glericidia. Je tourne le bouton de la radio. Nelson Mandela est libre, était libéré. Je dis voilà, je sens en moi le, un, un carillonnement de toutes les cloches en train de sonner. Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela, c'était vraiment extraordinaire. Et je crois que c'est prodigieux la vie de cet homme. Et je savais bien que sortir de prison n'était peut-être pas le plus difficile, il y avait la réalité qu'il fallait affronter le lendemain et qu'elle maîtrise de lui-même, il a montré pour essayer d'établir le dialogue et rétablir les Noirs dans leurs droits et préconiser et faire prévaloir l'avènement d'une Afrique du Sud Nouvelle, démocratique, c'est important, 
non racial est fondé sur l'égalité des droits. Mais je crois que c'est vraiment un personnage admirable. Césaire n'est pas par hasard, si vous voulez, euh, ce griot, ce djali, euh, chantre euh, de, 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 du négritude simplement, ou porte-parole poétique ou, ou, du, ou théâtral euh, de, de nos revendications. C'est en même temps quelqu'un qui voulait et qui veut encore aujourd'hui, à mon sens, euh, que nous puissions bâtir cette citadelle avec des règles qui nous soient propres et qui soient des règles qui qu'il identifie lui comme étant des règles de générosité, de solidarité, de, de, de sensibilité vis-à-vis -vis de l'autre, de ce qu'il est, de ce qu'il ressent et de ce à quoi il peut aspirer. Et il est évident que nous sommes passés à côté de cette problématique. Et l'Afrique d'aujourd'hui devra bel et bien, en reprenant peut-être le théâtre politique de, de Césaire, repenser l'ensemble du problème du droit, du problème du pouvoir, du problème de l'homme africain à l'intérieur de ce pouvoir. Nous refusons le fantôme blanc comme cause des malheurs du continent aujourd'hui. Le second pillage de l'Afrique noire n'est pas, à vrai dire, un pillage étranger, mais un pillage de nègres par un nègre. Là est le drame. On a beau vouloir inventer l'ennemi blanc, le réinventer. Mais nous répondons que s'il continue de besogner, s'il continue d'être justement le monstre qu'il a été pendant le commerce triangulaire, pendant la colonisation classique, mais c'est que quelque part, il y a eu des chevaux de Troie. Les dictatures africaines, les monocraties africaines, 30 ans de dictature du parti unique, il est évident que ça, c'est notre responsabilité euh, propre et interne. Je pense qu'il n'est d'aucun intérêt de faire la liste des griefs ou la liste de, de ce qui s'est passé, mais de voir les conséquences réelles aujourd'hui. On le voit dans la construction de nos États, on le voit dans l'organisation de nos États, dans les choix que l'on fait économiques ou autres. Il ne faut quand même pas oublier que le marxisme-lénimisme, le socialisme, le libéralisme n'ont pas été inventés en Afrique, mais ils ont été essayés. Un peu partout, saupoudré de quelques ingrédients euh, autochtones, mais malheureusement avec le succès que l'on connaît. C'est tout le tragique, par exemple, d'une indépendance comme celle du Congo, où, eh bien, un petit soldat est récupéré par la bête, par les puissances, et avec pour deux saints de détruire tout l'idéal, toute la vocation, tout à la pulsion de tout un peuple, de tout un continent et de tout le monde noir, car le Congo était un espace stratégique pour le peuple noir dans son ensemble, tout comme l'Angola, tout comme l'Afrique du Sud aujourd'hui. Ces espaces-là n'ont jamais pu aller à la liberté d'eux-mêmes par leur propre volonté. Et il est clair que les résultats, nous les voyons, c'est qu'après 30 ans d'indépendance, tout se passe comme si l'Afrique noire avait trahi Césaire. Je disais ceci, notre responsabilité, c'est que de nous dépend en grande partie l'utilisation que nos peuples sauront faire de la liberté reconquise. La liberté n'est pas une fin en soi, l'indépendance des pays coloniaux n'est pas une fin en soi. Et c'est là ce qui, plus profondément que nos particuliers devoirs, fonde notre devoir d'homme. Car quand Césaire parle de lui et de moi, quand il emploie ses, des possessifs, Chacun sait que derrière lui, il y a toute notre diaspora. Il y a tout le peuple aussi, africain lui-même. Il y a tous ceux qui, de par le monde, sont les amis de l'Afrique, qui croient en elle. Et l'échec ou le succès du continent, ce sont là des choses qui surdéterminent très fortement le destin de millions d'autres hommes dans le monde. Et la pensée de l'universel est toujours là. Il ne s'agit pas de petits combats régionalistes, mais il s'agit de préparer une ère nouvelle pour le monde tout, pour le monde tout entier et pour l'homme. Cette mise en garde prend toute sa mesure à la veille du grand lever de rideau contemporain sur l'Afrique, le soleil des indépendances. Un continent tout entier entre sur la grande scène de l'histoire et prend enfin son destin entre ses propres mains. 
Dire qu'il avait fallu attendre 1946 pour que soient abolis l'indigénat et le travail forcé. 1956 pour le suffrage universel. 1958 pour que la France propose aux colonies d'Afrique une place reconnue dans la communauté française à laquelle tous avaient répondu oui, à l'exception de Sécoutouré. Certes, la Guinée, dans le temps, aurait obtenu son indépendance parce qu'elle luttait pour cela. Mais peut-être le 28 septembre 58, elle n'eût pas été indépendante si le journal De Gaulle n'avait pas posé assez clairement, en prenant toutes ses responsabilités face à l'opinion mondiale et à, à l'opinion française, en prenant toutes ses responsabilités en disant qu'elle respecterait l'indépendance du pays qui aura choisi le 28 septembre 58 le sens de sa propre souveraineté. Une première vague de décolonisation sanctionne l'échec politique de l'Union française. Après la guerre d'Indochine, c'est la fin des protectorats français d'Afrique du Nord. Le Maroc et la Tunisie accèdent à l'indépendance et sont reconnus par la France comme États souverains et égaux. Quant à l'Algérie, elle est en état d'insurrection. En Afrique noire, entre 1958 et 1966, tout est allé très vite. Le général de Gaulle, en stratège familier des convulsions de l'histoire, face à l'effervescence soudaine des revendications, choisit pour la France un départ accéléré afin que ne se multiplie pas l'expérience algérienne. Je veux dire un mot d'abord aux porteurs de pancartes. Je veux leur dire ceci. Ils veulent l'indépendance. Qu'ils la prennent le 28 septembre Thank you. This is uh, so just a quick excerpt of the third uh, DVD uh, of this documentary on Emi Sizerhu, um, which traces um, his work and gives you a, a sense of um, how much and um, how much his work is connected to the continent, to the history, and to what was going on. And so apropos for tonight. Uh, for what we're about to see for a season in the Congo. So now I would like to invite um, our partner, uh, Martinique Tourism Authority, uh, with Valérie Vulcan, marketing manager, to say a few words, and then we'll see the play. So please welcome Valérie Vulcan from the Martinique Tourism Authority. Thank you. Good evening, bonsoir. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is a pleasure and honor to be here tonight at the Schomburg Center to celebrate Aimé Césaire. 2013 marks the centennial anniversary of his birth, and we are here to celebrate the life and eternal contributions of the famed poet, playwright, and politician Aimé Césaire, who has been celebrated throughout his home island of Martinique and the world. Césaire, who passed away in April 2008 at the age of 94, is widely hailed as a principal crusader for civil rights within the French West Indies, both through his writing and in his 55 years serving as the mayor of Fort de France. Let me tell, mo let me tell you more about this famed activist. Born in Basse Pointe, Martinique, in 1913, Césaire moved to Paris in 1931 on an educational scholarship. It was there that he created the literary uh, review, L'étudiant noir, the black student. This would serve as a forerunner to la négritude, the artistic and cultural movement founded by Césaire to encourage black youth to maintain a positive racial identity. In 1939, he returned to Martinique and was elected mayor of Fort de France in 1945, a post he held through 2001, except for a brief period in 1983-1984. In 1935, Césaire was admitted to the prestigious École Normale Supérieure de Paris and was one of the principal architects of the Negritude Movement the affirmation of black and African diaspora culture and heritage. 
Césaire's most famous poem, Cahier d'un retour au pays natal, was published in 1939. From 1945 to 2001, Césaire served as mayor of Fort de France and served in the French National Assembly from 1946 to 1993 as deputy. Aimé Césaire passed away on April 17, 2008 in Fort de France. In 2011, a plaque bearing his name was placed in Le Panthéon in Paris where some of the France's most revered citizens are buried, including Victor Hugo, Pierre and Marie Curie, Victor Schelcher, Jean Moulin, and André Malraux. Aimé Césaire was a, a true champion of the people of the Antilles, Africa, and the entire African diaspora. His words and his voice left a profound impression on all people and his life serves as an inspiration to artists and activists around the world. To commemorate the centennial memory of Aimé Césaire, we, at the Martinique Promotion Bureau, organized the following events this year. Poems recital at the United Nations during the International Day of Remembrance of the Victim of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade on March 25th, on the theme, Forever Free, Celebrate Emancipation, thank you. Writing contest with high school students from New York, and also in Martinique, on June 26, 2013, the Tony Morrison Society placed a bench by the road in Fort de France, Martinique, in honor of the 100th anniversary of the birth of Aimé Césaire. The bench in honor of Aimé Césaire is the 10th bench placement by the society. The bench plaque stated, this bench placed in honor of the 100th anniversary of Aimé Césaire, son of Martinique and world renowned poet, playwright, author, teacher, anti-colonialist, and political leader. The bench placement represents one of the keystone events in this year-long celebration and commemoration of Aimé Césaire in Martinique, France, and throughout the world. And tonight, we will feature extracts from Césaire political play, A Saison in Congo, here in New York at the Schomburg Center. And to know more about A Saison in the Congo, I would like to introduce uh, Mrs. Christelle Coita, who is in charge of communication at the Martinique Promotion Bureau. Thank you. Good evening, bonsoir. Ça va bien? So, written by Aimé Césaire in 1966, the play follows Lu Patrice Lumumba's rise as a national hero fighting for the Congo's independence through his subsequent struggle to protect its fragile freedom. The play is directed by Rico Spite and it's splicing film, dance, music, and poetry. This spirited production introduces a new generation to the poet leader who lit the fire of Africa. So tonight, as Valerie said, we're gonna see an excerpt of the play, and if you wanna see the whole play, it's, we'll, it will be at uh, La Mama's uh, Theater downtown on 4th Street from December 19 to the 22nd, so I encourage all of you to uh, come and uh, support the play. So let's, uh, let's uh, see. And then afterwards, uh, we will have a talk back uh, with uh, Rico Spite and Alex Gill.
the rainy season come, war will come to the season of red blood. The buffalo is strong, and the elephant is strong. Where can we hide? Their signs, those and tells. The buffalo will fall. The elephant will fall. There's been the heavy hand of God. The blood that season is coming. The season of our freedom. The blood that season is coming. The season of our freedom. The blood that season is coming! Let not be so wood! Let not be so wood! Forgetting the blowpipe. Bird brain says the child. The bird has forgotten the child. Remembers the bird. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I'm glad that you recognize that I'm entitled to an explanation. There's nothing to explain. Civil war, foreign war, anarchy. Patrice, I'm afraid your luxury the Congo can't afford. Can you be sincere? Do you really think your actions are saving the Congo? Doesn't it occur to you that by wrecking our constitutional government before we've even had time to set it up, you are endangering the very life of your country? You would have made things easier for us.
by stepping down on your own accord. But that's too much to expect of a politician. I have no other course but to dismiss you. But the old man is mistaken. I'm dismissing him too. I decided to neutralize the government. When I hear big words like that, I can't help but smelling a rat. Exactly what are you driving at? It is perfectly simple. The president fires the prime minister. The prime minister strikes back and fires the president. I'm fine with both of you. We are sick of politicians. In other words, you've decided to seize power. After all, you won't be the first colonel to stage a coup d'etat. But watch your step, Mukutu. The day when every discontented officer feels entitled to make a grab for power, there won't be much left of our country. A gang of thieves is no substitute for a state. Don't you dare. Damn, impugn my honesty. I am a soldier and always will be. I've appointed a committee of specialists to run the government until order is restored. Meanwhile, I am calling off the civil war. I have ordered the army to suspend operations in Kasai. There's plenty of work to do right here in Leopoldville. I won't remind you of our friendship, of the struggles. No, that no, we no, have no, no! Together, there's no point in discussing the past. Sure, I helped you get out of prison. I was with you when, at the Round Table Conference in Brussels, I campaigned, campaigned for you day and night. Five. Years of friendship. But I refuse to let friendship interfere with my duty as a citizen and as a Congolese patriot. This is the parting of ways. It is my duty to neutralize you. You're right. This is no time for personal sentiment. But have you ever stopped to think about Africa? Look here. No need of a wall map. It's engraved on the palm of my hand. Here's Northern Rhodesia. A silent country. Except for a foreman's curses now and then. The bark of a police dog. The burbling of a cult. They've gunned down a black man who drops without a word. Look, here's Southern Rhodesia. Millions of Negroes robbed, dispossessed, and herded into so-called townships. And then there's Angola. What is its main article of export? Not sugar, not coffee, but slaves. Yes, Colonel, slaves. And then, there is this little island, San Tome, dangling from it like a rag. This little island, this rock, devouring niggers by the thousands, by the millions, Africa's penal colony. Oh, yo, 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 yo. Oh, yo, 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 yo. Oh, yo, 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 yo. They took our boy away, sent him to San Tome, cause he had no car. Aye, aye, aye. They took our boy away, cause he had no car. Aye, aye, aye. Oh, yo, 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 yo. Oh, yo, 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 yo. 
Funny you never heard that song. I will teach it to you if you give me time. And then, further down, there is South Africa, the racist slave camp, with its tanks and planes, its Bible, its laws, its courts, its press, its hatred, its lies, its hard, cruel hearts. There's hope. You say there's hope. And it's true. Because deep down in their dungeon, like a diver deep under the ocean, they see a spot of light on the surface. A spot of light growing, growing. After all, why shouldn't they hope? There's been Ghana, Guinea, Senegal, Mali, Daomi, and not so long ago, Togoland. And tomorrow, the Congo. And Africa, Africa's children say to themselves, tomorrow isn't far off. Tomorrow, it's my turn. And they clench their fists and breathe a little freer, the air of tomorrow, the good salt air of freedom. Mokutu, do you know what you are doing? You are blackening out that little patch of light over the prisoner's cell. The great rainbow bird is wheeling over the cells of 250 million men. What is going to happen? But guess what? With your stupid club, you strike it down and the scaly cause of malignant darkness come down over the whole continent. I will not follow you into your apocalypse. I am not responsible for Africa, but for the Congo. And in the Congo, I mean to restore order. Do you understand? Order. Yes, it may be divided, it may be weak, some of our brothers may have been bought, but it will not fail us. Africa will not fail us. So let me introduce the cast. So you have uh, Ezra Mabengeza as Patrice Lumumba. You have Lee Sebastiani as uh, Mokutu. Gregory Bastien as a Senza player. And there's a beautiful Shiki Takami as uh, the dancer and Pauline also. So I know that uh, some of the cast are, I mean, is here tonight. So I would like to acknowledge uh, Quadi Stockington, who is playing um, Mpolo. Where are you? Yeah, he's here. And uh, I will introduce the rest of the cast. So you have J Jed Iker, Aisha as uh, Am Amashol, Ben Monk as Basilio, Julius Orlingthorworth as uh, Kala, and uh, Jennifer Joseph as Mama Makosi, if someone, one of them are in the room, and uh, uh, Trevor Brown as the soldier. So I really hope that you will come and see the play at La Mama, 
uh, starting on the 19th. It's a wonderful play. I hope you liked it already. So please come and support. Thank you so much. So now we have the talk back. And uh, I would like to introduce the two participants of the talk back. So I would like to call Alex Gill. So Alex is um, the current digital scholarship coordinator at Columbia University for Humanities and History. And he discovered the script, the manuscript for Elie Chiens and wrote a dissertation on it. The dissertation is on Césaire's penchant and for adapting his text to particular audiences in the Caribbean, the Americas, Europe, and Africa. He published several articles and chapters on Aimé Césaire, and he is also a co one of the co-editors of the critical edition of the complete works of Aimé Césaire, coming out next week in, oh, it came out already. He came out al uh, already, yes, very good. He's also the vice chair of uh, the Global Outlook Digital Humanities Initiative, and also the organizer of the That Camp Caribe unconference series, bringing DH, which is digital humanities, to the Caribbean since 2012. So thank you, Alex, for participating into that tollback. You may have a seat. And I will also call uh, Rico Spite. Rico? Uh, I hope Rico is on his way. So Rico is a director. Here is Rico. Welcome, Rico. He's the director of the play. Uh, Rico Spike is an independent producer, director, writer of film and theater. He is also a film and video editor and educator. His production credits include documentaries, narrative, television productions, web productions, and live theater. His documentary, Who's Gonna Take the Weight, the first installment of two-part series of the Parallel Lives of African American and Black South African Young People, was released in 1997. In 1999, that documentary screened at the 52nd Cannes International Film Festival. In 2007, Spite released a follow-up production titled Where Are They Now? This is a sequel to Who's Gonna Take the Weight? And um, it was broad broad broadcasted nationally in South Africa on South African Broadcasting Corporation Television. In 2010, he produced and directed Aimé Césaire, a season in the Congo at the Lion Theater. And uh, this year, he's bringing back to the stage a season in the Congo at La Mama next week. So thank you uh, very much for coming out tonight. And uh, we look forward to listening to you guys. I would like to acknowledge the team from the Martinique Promotion Bureau, the beautiful uh, May Clemente, also um, Evelyn, uh, Théophile, Catherine, and uh, Géraldine. So after this, we're going to have a nice Martinican reception. And uh, so if you want to uh, come and visit our island, we're more than happy to welcoming you and uh, visit Césaire country. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. And see you later. You want to start? So thank you so much, uh, Christelle, and thank you for being here. Um, we're really, really uh, honored to participate in this whole year of celebration of Césaire. So many events have taken place around the world, and um, we were able to get in under the calendar before the end of this year, his centennial year, so I'm really, really happy about that. Uh, this play um, that I am directing here was um, we did it once at the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the DRC, which was 2010. And then we started to think about the centennial. So it's been, for me, uh, kind of a life-changing um, event and feeling the importance of Césaire through this particular work, but also seeing that work in the context of so much of his other work this time, when we were thinking about the play and looking for a spine for what we would, how we would see this particular interpretation of the play, um, I and the cast 
Um, I mean, it's you know, it's director's responsibility, but you know, it's it's a group thing for us in a way. And um, so this time, there's a line in the play, and it says, um, "Africa will not fail us." Africa, it may be weak, it may be prostrate, it may be bound, but Africa will not fail us. That's a line that's in the play. And so that became the spine for this interpretation of the play. Africa will not fail us. And Césaire helped us to understand that. I mean, he, he, he helped us understand that through his work. He helped us understand that through his life. And it comes through in this particular um, expression of Césaire, A Season in the Congo. And it's not bound, you know, in any way. And it's interestingly not bound. It's interestingly uh, humanistic because it looks at Africa as primordial. And it looks at that as a way of talking about the humanity of all people, that if we trust in ourselves as people, that we will not fail. It may look otherwise, you know, it will not fail. And the other thing I want to say before Alex um, chimes in and presents aspects of Césaire's work is um, uh, this whole idea, this whole notion of Césaire as someone who stays, who stays. You know, so many of us expand and then we leave. And it becomes difficult for us to understand how it would be possible to negotiate, you know, out of circumstances that are completely contradictory. And that's what 1960 posed to uh, the writer Césaire, which made him take this work on, to look at the possibilities, the hope, you know, that 1960 presented, but then the, um, the contradictions that were also there. And to make us, therefore, aware of them even now to make us aware of the contradictions that exist now. And it's so palpable, you know, to me right now. You know, you look at it and it looks one way and it looks like, my, where, how much we've come. But then you look at it and you look at it another way and the contradictions are rampant. And I think the play helps us get back to that. So and for all those reasons, I feel like it's really wonderful. We have a wonderful cast uh, and everybody's kind of on the same page with, with, with regard to this. And it's been a way of understanding Césaire at even deeper le levels. And the last thing is just the idea of the diversity of the approaches that he takes, because there is so much of that with, with, with humanity, obviously, and obviously with African humanity. And so, you know, the, the, the naturalism, the historicity, the surrealism, all of it in the same piece, you know, the cinematics, it's all there, and I love it, you know, for that reason, yes. Yeah, I, uh, I I really like when you say that, that and that he's trying to make us struggle with all these contradictions, uh, and, and and I always thought of his place as a, as a place where he stages our inability to see all the different angles at the same time. That's right. Kind of he stages our blind spots, and we're in this really difficult political situations, historical situations, and and uh, and of course the challenge, the biggest challenge for for us is to act together. And, and even for, for those who have a little bit more power than others to, to grow within themselves the ability to lead in such a way that can reconcile all these contradictions. It's hard, it's difficult. He, he was a politician too, so he actually faced this in his practice. And he was there during the anti-colonialist uh, struggles uh, from the beginning. Uh, and, and of course he saw, he saw the potential, but he saw also the dangers. And, and uh, in his place, you already see predictions of things that will happen much later. And I wanted, to, I wanted to ask, I don't know if you, if you mind this format, but I, I, was, I had a couple of questions. I haven't seen the play yet, because uh, apparently nobody has, except for the actors and, 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 you know, that, uh, and I look forward to seeing it. But um, I happen to know that as he was writing this play, he went back and forth between his uh, sympathies for, for for Lumumba or Mabudu. And uh, the, I wonder if you could tell us, maybe give us a little preview, how, how do you reconcile those? Uh, and you still see echoes in the play that actually got published. You still see echoes of his wavering. Sometimes it sounds some reasonable things coming from, from either side. And, and you see the blind spots coming from different side. I don't know how, how you dealt with that in, in the play. Well, you know, <laughs> I mean, for me, Lumumba is a hero. So it's just like unparalleled, I mean, hands down. And I mean, I've decided, but Césaire, is more sophisticated than that, you know? And so 
um, I feel like because, I mean, what are human beings except contradictions? And so therefore, to really be able to have not a cardboard, you know, cartoon character, he gave us him and all of the contradictions, which also were a part of the, you know, the reconciling of which were the, you know, those were the, the, the stones, the stepping stones to his, his martyrdom and to his greatness. And so I feel like it's all there. It's all there. And so... But, you know, the interesting thing about that, too, the way that the play works is funny is because, you know, there were all these perspectives on this guy. You know, this man comes up in 1960, and he's committed. You know, he's decided, he's courageous, and he's committed to his people. Now, not, that doesn't happen with all leaders, you know, but it's to me, once in a while, one comes along who's not on the gravy train, you know, who's basically in it for people. And that's who this man is. And so, and just believed. And so... But, you know, for a lot of people, that's just unbelievable. You know what I mean? And so, therefore, and also it doesn't serve the agendas of a lot of people. And so, therefore, here he comes. And, I mean, it, like in the play, one of the really wonderful scenes is that it has the, uh, the June 30th ceremony. And, and, and it's, a lot of this is taken right from transcripts, you know, of what really happened. And so, basically, they're given the speeches. And so... Uh, uh, Cesar changes the name of some of the people, right? Uh -huh. So, Baudouin, who's the king of uh, Belgium, and he's this 30-year-old, Cesar, I mean, uh, Lumumba by this time is like 35, and Baudouin is coming, and he's, you know, he's, the, he's coming to hand over, you know, power to this uh, previously coloni you know, colonized nation. And so, you know, it's very, you know, pompously generous and that kind of thing. And so basically he comes and he gives his speech and he talks it, he's, you know, he puts his spin on what is being done, that, you know, we're doing this. And it's very paternalistic, and, but not that he knew that, but anybody else would have. If you read the speech, it's clear. But now, Lumumba, and, 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 and just a backdrop thing, is that Lumumba is the person who's uh, vested with uh, form, uh, like formateur. He's the one who's supposed to form the government. That, that was why he was prime minister. That's why he wanted to be it. And these guys were like, they didn't want him. They wanted Kasavubu or somebody else to be doing it, right? And so, but no, it's him. He was elected. And so, therefore, he's supposed to do it. But now, who's, who's, who's putting together the ceremony, you know, for this investiture? Of course, it's still, you know, until the investiture is had, it's still a Belgian possession. So, of course, they make the ceremony. But do they tell, you know, like when you have a, a you know, have like a big ceremony, the speeches are, are written and they're given to the press and they're given to all the people. He didn't get no speeches, you know. Nobody gave him no speeches. So he's like, well, where are the speeches? And so then he hears the speech. He's sitting there hearing the speech. And so he makes a speech. He wasn't even on the program. And then he gets up and he makes the speech. And all he does is tell the truth. That's all he does is tell the truth. And the world vilified him for telling the truth. And it wasn't even deep. It wasn't even, you know, like it could, but it wasn't even fierce. He just told the truth. And so what I'm trying to say in answer to your question, a very long-winded answer, is that basically these spins of him through the perspectives of others are all presented. So we see Césaire through the eyes of uh, Baudouin or Basilio, as he's named in the play. We see Césaire, I mean, we see, I'm sorry, we see Lumumba through the eyes of Baudouin, who is, you know, Basilio in the play. We see Lumumba through the eyes of his wife, a totally different view. We see Lumumba through the eyes of Mobutu, called Makutu, that you've just seen mm -hmm. in the play. And so all of that gives you the spectrum of it. And then we see Lumumba through his own spirit and the poetry of himself. And that's where I think I align 100% with Césaire because he makes him that poet visionary that is also Lumumba. That's what I think. And by definition, incomplete, and, and, and somehow with the, with a flaw that will lead to, to tragedy, as, at least as in the way that it's set up in, in, in the theater. And I, I, did, you, did you have a chance to watch uh, Palsy's uh, uh, documentary I've clip? Seen and, um, I've seen you've it. You've seen it. So it so yeah. starts at the beginning with, uh, with a Mrs. Air, um, um remembering the story of the first time he heard that Mandela had been freed and of course we're thinking about Mandela this week and uh and there is this there's always this um this tragic figure in the in the history of the Caribbean and the history of the Africa uh 
in the history of most oppressed people uh, in the world. Uh, these, these figures that almost had it. They, they, you, 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 you know, you feel like, man, if, you know, if this, if X or Y would have worked, you know, we, we could have we done it, right? Uh, and of course, Winnie Mandela herself came out uh, this week critiquing him for not being able to lift most of the blacks out of poverty in South Africa, right? Yeah, freedom. And, uh, but, 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 but then we have this masses uh, in poverty. And of course, um, uh, Cesare is, is, uh, also says in this clip that we watched, um, freedom is just a conduit to something, something else, something more uh, uh, deeper, uh, more elusive, and 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 I guess he's thinking about justice and, and global justice. When I said I was wondering if as you, as as the director of this play, you have you have do a special kind of close reading of the theatrical piece that that, that a scholar can only watch in admiration, because you read line by line, thinking how this is going to be performed, and it, if you could say a few words about this kind of encounter with the individual around whom we place our hopes and the more complex realities that require more collective activity. Uh, what is this dilemma? How do we sort, uh, get ourselves out of that dilemma? Uh, and that we are, for the most part, enthralled by these figures that seem to hold the hope. And at the same time, the knowledge in the back that they will not be capable indiv acting individually to, to do this. I don't know if I know, but I think that in terms of the way I, we're interpreting this play this time is that it's kind of picking up on what you said. I mean, this idea of a continuum, a part of a continuum, because basically, you know, this struggle that's ours and this arc of justice that we participate in, for me, is, it's, you know, it's, um, it's ancestral, it's generational, and it's, you know, it's a composite of the legacies and, and the understandings of people like Mandela, you know, despite the disappointments, that the, the principles and, the, and, 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 and how those principles are kind of adopted, the influence of those principles on us. And so, I mean, it's interesting because my, I think probably early, one of the early influences for me in terms of uh, Lumumba was a man named Lumumba, I mean, uh, Alombe Brath, somebody who's, in, who's a New Yorker, a Harlemite, and who had an organization called the Patrice Lumumba Coalition. And so, you know, it was like this idea of someone who understood that the privilege of leadership carries the responsibility of the understanding of everybody, that we're all in it. And so for me, I've always thought that really wonderful, important leaders do a thing. I mean, because usually they're privileged in some way in order to get that leadership. But then it's like this class suicide because they're not on the gravy train. They're not there for that. And so basically they understand that who they live for is, and, and trust and they trust. And so I don't think it was a problem for him. I think Lumumba, I do believe he was a visionary. I, knew, I know that he always talked early on about the, like so many of the, our leaders, about the possibility that death could happen. But it had nothing to do with the goal, you know, because the goal was beyond that. And that's what they understood. So I think that it is this, con this continuum. Because Africa is primordial. I mean, it's, it, it, it continues. And it's not just our diaspora, it is, but it's beyond that. And I think that as long as we know that, you know, we're always, I mean, we're, we're never, uh, we, we, we're on time, and I believe that that's the, the, that Césaire knows that. Césaire goes back, you know, he goes back, not all of us do. Because sometimes it's hard to go back home, you know, and do what you need to do and deal with those contradictions, you know, and especially if you're a politician where you also have to look at pragmatic things. That's the hardest part to have to also do that too. It's one thing to be principal. So I think that that was a nice thing about, an interesting thing about, one of the many interesting things about Lumumba is that he is this person who's a politician. And so sometimes you know how it is, it gets slippery when you're a politician. You have to do things that are like politics. One polit hand behind your back. Yeah, you have, to do you, things. you have to do things to make things happen. And so sometimes it feels like, wow, you know, is that greasy or what? But the point is, is that 
the bigger picture is always there and it never, that never wavered, I think, in, in terms of what the history that I know and in terms of the history that I see referenced, you know, in, in Césaire's work. So I, I think that rhymes really well with uh, the rest of uh, Césaire's plays and, and his poetry and, and even the, the biography uh, he wrote of Toussaint Louverture. I mean, uh, he, he, he likes to focus on these visionary characters that are also have pragmatic uh, needs and uh, is, uh, how to reconcile the one with the King Christophe to Saint Louverture, Lumumba, and then Caliban himself in, in the in the in the a tempest for a black theater is is also uh, even though the play is one of his most allegorical experiments, he's a man who needs to get something done uh, and at the same time has a poetic vision. Uh, and around that all though is this idea that he kept emphasizing throughout his life from his student years. So he was a student in France, and uh, back in those days, uh, I, I imagine him in Paris having these heady conversations about philosophy you know, and all these things. Uh, and we have a good record of what, it, uh, what he was reading back in those days. And, and one of the things he said, uh, he used to admire this uh, German philosopher uh, who is now known as one of the worst racists uh, from the 18th century, Hegel. He used to say that, uh, that, well, he had one idea, which is that you can found the universal on the particular. He said that we can, the, the, the idea that, uh, the, the, uh, that there is the, the particular is always separate from the universal is, is false. And that, that in our own particular historical circumstances, in our race, in our gender, and in our specificity as human beings, that's where we find the idea of the human. So, and, and he kept emphasizing this in many ways or another. He's recognized today as a universalist thinker, somebody who was looking out for, for humanity, uh, but within the particular, within the particular historical experience of a people. Uh, and I was wondering if you saw a little bit of that in the, the, the season in the Congo, you see, the least, I, when I read it, I, I, that's the least universalist of the plays that, that I see. I, I have a hard time seeing allegorical references to other situations of oppressed people and other places in that one. It so, seems to be so historically specific. I mean, maybe you can disabuse me of this idea. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that, you know, historicity that he's doing that is this is very, it's all, it's very representational in a way. But I think that this idea of um, universality, especially in the figure of the, the ritualized African aspect of, you know, reintroducing the Sansa player, you know, to really take specifics, but to apply them at a, a non-specific level. And that's how I feel one of the ways that he does that, that he actually makes us see in the terms of uh, like um, these, what are these things uh, when you, um, these, uh, yeah, these, it's kind of like, um, when you have these, what are they? They're not uh, fables. Yeah, they're sort of like fables. I mean, when you basically have these kind of life lessons in sometimes in parable. And so I think with this Sansa element, kind of introducing sort of like a chorus type of uh, element in the play so that it's looking at, you know, it's very representational for a minute. And then next thing that you know is not representational. Yeah, it's a, a whole different level. And so basically, you know, it's just, I mean, sometimes you don't know whether, you know, it's appropriate to, you don't know what the appropriate emotion is at a particular moment in the play. Because there is no appropriate <laughs> emotion. You know, it's all of the above. And I think that likewise, specificity and universal, universalism are likewise the same. I mean, because there are, there are both. One is in both, and both, you know, one is in the other, I think. And I think he's making that clear. I, I so I don't I know if that disabuse, that. you know, you. It's a hard yeah. idea to wrap your head around, but, but it is, yeah, the idea that it is because we're always specific. That, that, right. That How else can we be? I mean, yeah, exactly. in a way, we are yeah. specific, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now I think we should open it up to, to, to the audience uh, so, that, so that we don't... Uh, I have just an internal monologue between you and put, put between everybody us asleep. Too, yeah. yeah. So if we can maybe pass around that. Is there another mic that we can was, pass around? What was that one? 
there's yeah, one over just, there. And people can go to that mic on the, on the. All right, or they can go to that mic. Uh, so we love to take, actually we can take, uh, we've only been focusing on, on season and the COVID and trying to, to, to shape our questions around that. But of course, Cesare had a very complex relationship to Africa. And I think you should, before we do it, why don't you just let us know, uh, apart from the uh, introduction, what you're focusing on right now in terms of Cesare. Sure, sure, sure. I, uh, um, so the, you know, the play that I work with is the first one that he wrote. Uh, the thing is that uh, nobody knew it as a play. Uh, he, in 1941, when he was, uh, he just returned from, um, from Paris uh, um, to Martinique, um, he started writing a play under the, uh, under the watchful eye of the Vichy occupation. So it was this all around the time when he was a teacher and uh, he was uh, with a group of friends and his wife, Suzanne, he was uh, uh, editing the journal Tropique, which became a really important journal uh, uh, later on. And uh, he started working on this play uh, secretly uh, uh, based on the Haitian Revolution. And the main character of the play was uh, Toussaint Louverture. And then uh, and the play follows the chronological narrative of the, of the Haitian Revolution. Um, and it was a, it's a very violent play, uh, more violent than, uh, than the other three. The, uh, the phrase, kill the whites, is repeated uh, more than 60 times in, in, in that play. Uh, and uh, the, he sent the play out, uh, he, went, he, he went through several stages where he was writing. He started writing the play as a very straightforward uh, uh, play, uh, historical drama. He started adding elements, uh, he started complicating that, uh, as he, in the writing process, he started complicating uh, the story. Uh, in the beginning, Toussaint wasn't a central character, just another character. Then he started making it about that figure, about the poetic, uh, visionary politician, right? Um, and eventually the chorus stopped being just about describing what the scene was. Uh, the chorus in the beginning of the play, when he started writing the play, had a, the role of describing uh, scenes that could not be staged. Uh, typical use of the chorus, whereas a bloodshed, a war, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but in, mm -hmm. it started being itself uh, sort of a voice of prophecy and uh, sort of the, the poetic chorus that we know from, from him later, mm -hmm. right? So eventually, in 1943, at the end of 1943, during, still during the, uh, the, the period, a period of censorship and, and political oppression in Martinique, he sent uh, a manuscript out to André Breton, the, the surrealist mm -hmm. uh, poet uh, in New York. And um, uh, the idea was to get it out of Martinique first, but maybe try to find a publisher. And, uh, and André Breton passed it on to Ivan Gaul, a Franco-German poet who at that time was helping pu uh, publish Césaire uh, in New York and who also was the translator of the first time that the Cahier de Henri de Pays Natal was published in English mm. uh, in New York in, in 1947. Mm. Uh, uh, Breton was not famous for his uh, uh, friendliness. Uh, he. Uh, he was a difficult man, and he got into a fight with the, with uh, with Ivan Gol, and they, they uh, Ivan Gol uh, never spoke to him again. And Breton kept asking him, "Send me the Césaire manuscript back." Uh, and 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 Ivan Gol was not talking to him. So Ivan Gol eventually, after the war, after World War II, took the manuscript with him to his hometown in the in a small town in France called Saint Dié des Vosges, and uh, close to the border with Germany. And there he lived a peaceful life and died. Uh, of a late age and donated his papers to the municipal mm. library there exactly. where, the, where, the, where, where I found the manuscript about four or five years ago. So I started working on that. Wow. Um, yeah. It's a fascinating story. Uh, Césaire eventually would transform this manuscript into a poem that was published in 1946 called, uh, called And the Dogs Were Silent, that we know mm. today, yes. Les Chances yeah. which he then in 1956 turned into a play again. Mm. Okay. But by then it was a complete, it's a very yeah. different affair than the, than the one he wrote originally. Uh, so I worked a lot on that. I also am one of the editors of the Complete Works, which just released today in Paris. Congratulations. Uh, there yeah. was a, yeah, there was a, yeah. a scholarly edition of the Complete Works of a Mrs. Sarah. That was a seven year project uh, where we put together an international team of scholars to look at the manuscripts, look at all the published texts and try to correct errors and you know, provide a, an edition that, that, um, 
not only for the for the scholars, but one that that also the public could use to more or less get a little bit more in-depth look at uh, at Cesare's work. Uh, I recently a couple of weeks ago we just organized a big conference on mm -hmm. Cesare. You were there. Yes, that was yes, an ex yes. uh, an experimental conference in which we a two-day event. The first day we decided we we invited the professors, students, librarians, and the public to come and work for one day all together in one room to see if we could build the largest bibliography of Césaire wow. online, uh, of his, uh, the, the things he wrote, but also those people who have written about him. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm proud to say that at the end of the day, we had 2,100 wow. entries uh, of Césaire. Yeah. And it's open to the public. And, uh, yeah. Those of you who are interested in learning more about Césaire, uh, this is, uh, this is out there for you. Uh, if you if you Google legacies of Césaire, you will arrive at our site, uh, Columbia University Legacies of Césaire. The second day, then we we invited eight scholars to answer four questions about Césaire, about his legacy. What a, what is a, what does he mean in the political realm for us in the 21st century? What does he mean in the poetic realm? And we had a great day, and, and, and of course you were left out because you came at lunchtime. Yeah. And, 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 and we we missed yeah. you. We wish you would have been there. Yeah. So a lot of work, a lot of work uh, uh, on Césaire. I personally, I I think, I come at Césaire as as someone who is always interested in in figuring out um, what what is the best uh, thinking out there on 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 what makes us all human, on the kind of politics, yeah. the kind of poetics. Yeah. And I, I think Césaire is probably, and you know, for me still, uh, the the deepest thinker on on what a world that in which uh, uh, justice and freedom uh, uh, would look like, and uh, and one that and and he, his work is also always that self reflection mm -hmm. of like and how I fail and how our leaders fail, mm -hmm. but also pushing forward with that hope so i can't think of any other of any race of any uh, of any gender i can't think of any other th writer uh man of action who with his own actions uh, embodies that contradiction uh, yeah. other than cesare that's why i dedicate the good years of my adult life uh to his study so wonderful long-winded yes <laughs> here we go i'd like to thank you um very much for your your work uh amy cesare I got into trouble once because I tried to say that negritude, which he was very much part of, as was um, various writers throughout the Antilles, including Haiti, uh, where René Piquillon had also discussed negritude to a great extent. However, he is not translated for many reasons. Haitians always say that it's because they did certain things and they were always the first ones in this hemisphere, so they still um, get punished, uh, historically so. Um, but the point is, I was originally trying to say is that I tried to compare negritude and I said that the new term coming out of Martinique was creolite, creolite. And I thought, I said, well, maybe this is, um, it stems, you see, I felt I was saying something from negritude and, and various people said, no, 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 because negritude is the specificity, you see. And creolite is, I am now saying, the general, um, the generalization of negritude. Um, my question really is, having watched for the last couple of years what has happened to Pan-Africanness. And I view negritude as definitely Pan-Africanism in influence and influencing Pan-Africanism. Having watched what happened to leaders who were idealistic and great Pan-Africanists, and also even just viewing recent history, um, should we be worried, concerned. How do we help leaders who are idealistic and having to face a, a world that deals very much like that general presented in, in what we got from the play, 
It is about the industrial, military industrial complex, I'm afraid. And so many idealists are destroyed, like Lumumba. They are replaced by people like Mobutu. So is there anything other than the love that we, we feel from Aimé Césaire, some way to protect those who really do <laughs> represent, give their lives to and their work to um, as Pan-Africanists who love their people and want to be in politics. And what I've seen is that they are destroyed. When they try to reach into something more, they are destroyed. I'm concerned, maybe I shouldn't be, for many countries in West Africa, as well as South Africa, when I, when I see what is going on. And I don't see that we, um, we, we have love. I, feel, I mean, we, those of us here, we clearly love the culture. We are here to support. But is there anything that, anything you can give us about how, what do we do if we can't demonstrate in the streets, what is it exactly that we can do? And this is a heavy question because both of you are very intellectual. I know. Okay. No. Thank you. No, you, it really should be Alex, but he's doing this. <laughs> but uh, I mean, the only thing that comes to my mind, it, it, you know, I'm also interested in, um, I'm trying to do this project on uh, Fanon. And you know, Fanon was a student at one point of uh, Césaire's. And for me, one, one reason, one thing about the two of them, and one thing that I feel that is important, is to have the right view, I believe. I've always believed that having the right view is your armor. If you don't have the right view, then you'll go wrong. And I think that one thing that we get from Fanon, who at one point embraced negative as well, uh, is this idea of the existence or the persistence of anti-black racism. I mean, it is there. And so if we understand that, then we understand the, some of the machinations. If we don't, then we miss them. And so then it's easy to become victim by them. So that's what I, that's what I use. I mean, that's what I believe in. That's what I see. That's what, you know, Fanon teaches me. That's what Césaire teaches me. And I feel that we see it in, you know, in this play as well. You know, it's a, it's a way of seeing it. It's so interesting. Yeah, that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the, um, there's a one, uh, it, one of the things that's, that I find in Cesare's poetry is that he opens up vistas. He allows you to jump from the, mm -hmm. from this anemone in the sea to constellations in the sky. Uh, and these kind of moves that he makes in the natural world, though, he'll do them in the political world. So he allows you to see from the small political maneuvers, uh, the role of friendship in driving, a con in, the, in driving the destiny of a country to the structural issues. So of course, I, I, I don't think it's fair though, I, I, wanted, I, I did wanna, uh, at least, I don't think it's fair to call Cesare an idealist. I think he was a pragmatist in the highest sense of the word. He was a no, he's not a fool. He was, he was he not, not a fool, but not a, but not a man who sacrificed ideas for the reality on the ground. On the contrary, he always emphasized context at all times to have a vision of what the cards on the table are. Let's see what our best move is based on what we know. And always a pedagogy of vision. Right? Like, try to see more. You have blind spots. Let's train you. Train your mind, your spirit to see more. And as I said, he, he, he was so adamant about this that sometimes he pushes us to try to see things that, that, that it's, all, it's almost impossible for us to see, for example, how the unwritten history is part of our bodies. How that, that drowned history of oppression in the world is actually in our bodies. I mean, I, I have a hard time with that one. It's, it's not easy. How do you, okay, hold on, hold on, Cesare. I, I'm trying to see it, you know, but, uh, it, but uh, uh, so, 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 yeah, no, on the, on the contrary, it's an, uh, the idealist is the man like Eichmann. That's the idealist. That's the man who sacrifices, uh, the, um, uh, who becomes unethical because he is fighting for an idea. 
Césaire is now fighting just for one idea. If he has one idea, is that we are all human. Hi, I just had a quick question. Um, I'm here with my mom, and we're from Kenya. And obviously, you know that we were colonized by the British at some point. So um, can you say anything about Aimé Césaire's intentions to reach out to the Anglophone black world and the Lusophone black world? Because I know going to school, I had no idea who he was and what it meant. And I only came across negritude in college. So yeah, if you could answer some of those. It's a, it's a fraud question because um, <laughs> he, had, he had a complex relationship with the, with the Anglophone world. Um, in 1956, when the Congress, uh, the first um, black con international black, uh, black Congress, uh, I can't remember the, na the name in English uh, escapes me, but uh, the, um, he had a big fight with Richard Wright. Uh, famous now, historically, almost legendary, sometimes too legendary, it's one of the facts are obscured. Uh, uh, he thought that the, the, that, the, uh, that the American contingency uh, was exceptionalist. Uh, uh, he, he didn't, they, they weren't playing the Pan-Africanism game the way he wanted uh, to, to, to play it. Uh, and of course, Richard Wright did have reservations. Uh, so that's one, uh, one story about his re uh, relationship to uh, the Anglophone world. Anglophone Africa is another, is another story. I've, I've, and he focused most of his life on the Francophone African world. He helped run a press called Fr Presence Africaine, which is still there. Um, in the beginning, helped uh, get it up and running. And, and, uh, and was a voice, an important voice within it for, for a long time. Um, it's good to know that, that it's really funny as a student he, at the, in Paris, he wrote his thesis on Southern uh, black writers in the United States. Uh, that still remains like, for scholars, that's like the, the, the holy grail of uh, the Césaire archive, whoever finds uh, that one. Uh, We'll get drinks for life from that. <laughs> um, I'm sorry to that 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 it, it's hard. We always get that question here in the in the United States. Uh, that and it's hard to answer. He didn't he didn't have the kind of relationship we would have wanted him to have. I don't know if you know something I don't. Uh, no, I think that we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> that is what we done. Well, let's uh, give a round of applause to our two fabulous speakers and guests. I want to especially thank them for keeping Emi Césaire and his legacy and his work alive. You are passionate uh, about it and um, you know, teaching students about his work, I think is how we keep it alive. And Enrico um, having the play uh, running uh, in New York City. So that's for us here at the Schomburg and uh, all the partners involved in the Centennial activities. I think we did well and we did good by him. So for you who came tonight, thank you for sharing this moment with us. And we are going to have a little reception outside and we can continue the conversation. So good night and thank you.